Good morning, family. It's so good to be with you here and to uh, be with you and to share a word with you. Uh, I know that um, some of you, uh, my name is Pastor Ofa. Uh, my wife and I, um, Dean Jackie, she's the girls' head dean here in the uh, girls' dorm. And we are the senior pastor family down at the, uh, or at the uh, city church. Uh, coming up at the end of this month, February, will be our t- will complete two years there as senior pastor. So, it's good to be here in the valley, uh, to be here in this city, to be a part of this community as we grow and share together. As it was said, Pastor Rome is gone, and so I just want to give you the freedom that while the cat is away, the mice will. Is that all right for us this morning? Can we just talk as family and as friends here this morning as we come together in this moment of church, in this time of worship, in this time that we have get set aside to allow God to speak to us, that God will just do just that, that we're going to give him full permission to speak to us. Is that all right? Are you in agreement this morning? We're going to give God full permission, full access to speak to our hearts and our minds, and to do what only He can do. Is that all right? So as we come, because if we don't allow God to do this for us, then our our meeting is meaningless. There will be no benefit or no profit if we don't allow God and the Holy Spirit into our hearts to speak to us individually and then collectively as a family. Is that all right? So with your permission, we're going to invite God once again to speak to us. Let us pray. Our God and soon coming King, we are so grateful to be gathered together. Thank you for the invitation of Sabbath so that we can leave our work, that we can leave our studies, that we can leave the things that often, um, that we often carry throughout the week and to come and set aside a special time, Sabbath, to where we can come and rest They're where we can come and give you our burdens and our worries, our things, our anxieties, our relationships, our families, to bring to you our tithes and offerings, our praises and our petitions. You've given us Sabbath to set aside this time where we can entrust you with all things, knowing that you are a all-loving, most powerful God who will do absolutely everything in your power to save your people. And so we thank you for this time that we've come together. Send your spirit. And as we've all collectively have agreed, Lord Jesus, we give you full access to our hearts and our minds. Speak to us individually and collectively, and please have your way with us now is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we get into our word here this morning, as it was shared, I think it was Mr. Mensik who shared your theme or the motto of this church are three things. We are called to what? Love. Second, to serve. And third, to what? Connect, love, serve, and connect. And I love that this morning. And so I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Many of you know this by heart. Many of you have read this over and over. And maybe some of you, like Elder Bob here, have shared that as part of your commitments to each other and your spouse in your in your in your weddings. But if you would turn there with me to these well-known verses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you are there, please say amen. There are a few of you, are there just a few more who are opening up their Bibles here this morning, and we're going to read together 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we'll begin in verse 1, and we'll read the whole chapter here, and then we'll get on with our teaching. Beginning in in chapter 13, verse 1, I'm reading from the New King James, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not... I have become sounding brass or a what? A clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not, I am. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not, it profits us absolutely Nothing. Such a waste of investment. Would you agree? Verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not what? Puffed up. Does not behave 
rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love, verse 8, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a? I understood as a? I thought as a? But when I became a man or a young woman, I put away what? For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I as also am known. Verse 13, can we read it together? And now abide faith. The greatest of these is love. A few weeks ago, I was... Uh, at home and one of the staff members across the street gave me a call and said, Ofa, there's, a, um, there's an, an older elderly woman who is hanging out here by BV. And I don't know if many of you know this older woman or had seen her just a few weeks ago. She was a, come to find out that this woman here had come from Tacoma. She got off the bus and she was coming to visit family and she got off at the wrong stop. She was in her, what, mid-70s, she got off the bus and was disoriented and was found walking up and down our street here, where she spent the next evening somewhere around in our neighborhood, maybe slept outside of our church doors here. But 7 o'clock in the morning, she was standing in front of BV, and the teachers and the staff there were trying to figure out, as parents were dropping off their students or, or their kids, they didn't know what else to do with this woman, and they tried to talk to her, they tried to help her. She wasn't, she wasn't responding, she couldn't speak the language, they weren't able to speak and communicate effectively, and so they called the police. And when the police arrived, they came and they found this elderly woman, and they tried to help her, but they couldn't do anything, absolutely nothing. And I get this phone call, Ofa, do you think you can come down and help this woman? I said, I, I'm about to drop off my kids, and then I'll see what I, what, what I could do. We stop by and we drop off my kids and I'm headed back and I'm trying to talk to this older woman. Do you think I was successful? Absolutely not. Why? Because she was turned off to everything else that anybody was trying to do. She didn't want the blanket. She didn't want a coat. She didn't want socks. She didn't want anything from anybody around her. And the police said, Opha, we can't do anything with her. So we're leaving. You guys figure out what to do with this woman here. It was freezing cold that night. And so I drive past this woman, and as I'm driving past her, I pull over to the side as she's making her way from BV right down Academy Drive, and she's headed back to the Academy, and I pull off in front of her, and the moment I step out, she looks at me, and she goes, oh, this guy again. <laughs> and so I'm watching her limp her way, and I pop up my trunk, and I pull out a bottle of water, and as I'm trying to talk to her, she doesn't want anything to do with me. And so I offer her a bottle of water. And that seems to have softened her heart a little bit. And she goes, all right, I'll drink some water. And then I ask her, we're trying to communicate. What's wrong with your foot? Huh? What's wrong with your foot? Huh? And I can tell she's limping. Are you hurting? She goes, yeah, hurt. So I invite her and I open up the door and she goes, get into my car and have a seat. And she goes, no, no go anywhere. You no take me, no. But I invite her, have a drink. Are you hungry? What's wrong with your foot? I'm not taking you anywhere. I just want to sit with you. And so I invite her and I open up the front door. She climbs in and she has a seat and I take off her little house shoe that she was wearing, soaking wet. Her toes were a bit blue and almost green because she was frozen. And I took her little feet and I placed them in my hands and I began to massage it a little bit. And you can see 
that this hardened heart of this woman who was confused and lost spent the night out maybe just outside on our porch here, freezing cold throughout the night as she sat in, my, in, in, this, in the car and I took off her little shoe and I began to massage her puny little feet, frozen. She began to soften up and I said, I will help you. You go with me. Yes, I go. Paul is telling us that we can do all these great things in this life. We can feed the hungry. We can preach the gospel message, these prophetic prophecies that God has blessed this church with. Amen? We can do all these great things, but in the absence of love, we are absolutely nothing but a what? Does that sound nice to you? Without love. Can you imagine why the world doesn't want to hear you anymore? Why we have no influence in the city? Can you blame them from turning their ears off and walking away? We have become absolutely nothing but a clinging. You want to continue that? What if I stopped preaching and did this for the next 30 minutes that you are accustomed to? Can you blame the kids for leaving? Can you blame them for not wanting to come and be a part of this movement? Does something have to change? No? Can we do something different? Are you willing to? I want to give you three principles that I found here that I think we could apply, taken from our biblical reading here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Three simple teachings that maybe I've paraphrased it, but I've th three things I've gathered from my own study through this book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that I think I can summarize and maybe give us three practical things we can do as a church, three things we can do as students, three things we can do as parents, three things we can do as children, three things that would make this world a better place as I reflect on this in these next few verses here in verse four, chapter 13, verse 4 through 7. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up, does not behave, behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. First moment of teaching here this morning that I gather from what Paul tells me here. Gossip versus the gospel. There is no room for gospel, for gossip when it comes to the gospel. If love is involved and we are called to be a people of love, Love does not gossip. Can you follow me? What is gossip? Casual or unconstrained conversation or reports about other people typically involving details that are not confirmed as being true. Did you get that? Merriam-Webster says this, gossip is information about the behavior and personal lives of other people. A person who often talks about the private details of other people's lives. Are you following me? 
Perry Noble in his book, The Most Excellent Way to Lead, defines gossip as this. Gossip is talking negatively about another person or situation to someone who doesn't have the authority to do anything about it. Can you follow me? It would be, as an example, you have a problem with a teacher across the street or a student in your next dorm room or a student in class. Instead of talking to that parent or that teacher across the street, we then find a parent in the parking lot. I'm talking to the adults here. We find another parent in the parking lot and we share it with her. Then we go into the office and we share with Suzette all the issues we have with that teacher without facing that teacher. And then we come over here and harass Caitlin and Pastor Rome. And then the word gets out to Auburn City. Hey, we have an issue with this individual, but you haven't addressed the teacher yet. Are you following me? That's what? because you're telling everybody else about somebody else's business who can do absolutely nothing about it. Why? Because our Christian method, God has, caught, has challenged us, Jesus challenges us, that if you have an issue, you must go to who? If we're going to love, and we're going to serve, and we're going to connect, we must stop the gossip. And here's the challenge why. Kids, we know this in high school. It happens all the time. He said, she said, he said, did this, do da, da, da. And then it becomes a huge mess, doesn't it? It always happens this way. Now, this is the problem with it. Gossip tells semi-truths and lies about other people, which means you are now devaluing and defacing someone's value in somebody else's eyes. The gospel, on the other hand, does not tear down, but it does what? Huh? You don't know that about the gospel? When we gossip and we put other people down, the gospel challenges us to do what? Lift up. That it rejoices in the truth. It doesn't take pride or joy in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Paul will then go and write this about what gossip is in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 24 to the end of the chapter. He puts all this in with adultery, uncleanness, all these ugly, nasty things that are vile, that, are un that God doesn't take pride or joy in, things that are shameful, even to the point in verse 28 where he says, you act like as if you have a debased mind and you are not fitting unrighteous sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness. He, he, he mentions all these different things. And in the midst of that, he includes these little whisperers, gossipers, devaluers, people who spread lies about other people. And it destroys love. It destroys love, and it destroys the gospel. gospel. Gossip curses, and the gospel blesses. Gossip tears down where the gospel builds up. Gossip is informational. The gospel is inspirational. Gossip is scandalous, but the gospel is saving scandalous people. Goss gossip is rude, but the gospel is redemptive. Gossip hurts, but the gospel brings healing. Gossip deceives, but the gospel delivers. Gossip is fault-finding in people while the gospel is forgiving people. Gossip mentioned here in James is from hell, but the gospel we know comes from where? Above. Gospel brings hope and strength, courage for the battle ahead. Gossip, gospel, we're called to love. Second point that I've gathered from reading 1 Corinthians chapter 13, another biblical love principle that I find, that it doesn't boast or parade itself. It's not puffed up. What's love got to do 
with Auburn Adventist Academy Church and our school just across the street. Gossip and gospel. My kids love popsicles. Anybody else love popsicles? My kids love popsicles all year round. And the moment mom and dad say to one of our kids, you can have a popsicle, there's four little ones in our house. You tell one, and guess what? Dad said we can have popsicles. Everybody is in the freezer. Everybody's in the garage freezer. They're pulling out all the popsicles. And guess what happens? I say, yes, you can have some popsicles. I leave for a moment and go up into my room for a, for a split second. The next thing I hear, Malachi is screaming his head off. Josiah is standing there saying, I'm sorry. Sissy is chewing on a popsicle. There's a mess in the kitchen. There's a mess everywhere in the house. Toys scattered all over the place. Parents, can you relate? And then we walk in with that one number one parental question. What in the world is going on in here? Guess what happens? Malachi, who's crying, Josiah busted me over the head. Josiah's like, I didn't do it. Michael made me do it. Michael turns around and says, I didn't do it. Since he said we can have popsicles, we went from popsicles to punching somebody in the head. Somebody else is crying. There's a fallout in the living room. I don't know why the kitchen is on fire and the TV's off the wall. And nobody knows what happened. Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent, the serpent blamed God, Abraham blamed Hagar, Hagar blamed Ishmael, Ishmael this whole mess, Sarah standing there in the midst of this whole thing, Esau, Jacob, and all throughout history. We continue the blaming game. As opposed to owning it. Gossip, gospel. We blame it. It's your fault. It's your fault. They did it. It's everybody else's fault. And Israel has done it along the way. All the way down throughout history. We blame you why we're in bondage, God. We blame you, Moses, why we're out here. We're going to die out here in the wilderness. You brought us out of that po- out of slavery, out of bondage. You brought us to die out here in the wilderness. Moses, it's your fault why we're all hungry. It's your fault why we're thirsty. It's your fault now that we cried for meat and you gave us meat and now it's coming out of our ears and our nostrils. It's your fault that we ate so much. It's your fault that it's your fault, your fault, your fault. Do you hear what I'm saying? If we're going to love together, serve together, and connect together, we got to stop blaming each other for everything that's happened in this crazy world. And at some point, take some ownership and own it. Honest conversations builds community. It restores families. And it brings hope. That in the midst of all things, if we can love honestly with integrity and own the things that we've done, it goes a long ways. Now, I don't do this often. I'm not as good as you think I might be. I might do some things bad in the house, and my wife will come home and be looking at me like, you done messed up. I said, I didn't do it all. My kids did it with me. (laughs) And you're at fault for marrying me. But I would be further down the road if I would just have some integrity, own my mistakes, love my wife and love my family enough to say, hey, I screwed up this time. Yeah, kids, I'm sorry, dad messed up. If we would just own it, we would be better off. And I think Paul challenges us to do the loving, the most loving thing 
is in moments of crisis, in moments when we are challenged, in moments when our integrity can be lost, you and I must be of love and of God enough that we can trust him through the difficult moments of this life to say, hey, despite what happens, I will own it. Because we know what happened to Israel. They turned their backs on God and they ended up in bondage. And yet they turned around because they abandoned and left God. They turned back and said, well, it's your fault. Without realizing what, and being honest and truthful with their part in the whole mess. You and I are not perfect people. Sometimes it just takes owning it. Because sometimes when Ofa doesn't own it, you know what I think my wife hears? <laughs> we live in a rough house. So when we don't own it, can't blame the school, can't blame the teachers, can't blame everybody all the time. At some point, it's you. So that we stop sounding like this, and every time somebody sees you coming around the corner, they're not rolling their eyes. Oh my, no. I can't deal with her today. Not today. Not doing it. Can't believe it, no. But when you begin, when you stop blaming and we begin to own it, it will be natural for you to connect. It becomes natural to want to serve because we experience love together. I'll make my last point, and then we're off to the cafeteria, right? Is that what we're doing here today? Point number three, the first is gospel over gossip. Own it over blaming. And our third here is love over hate. Is that okay? We don't hate people. As followers of Christ, we're called to love people. Is that all right? We are called to love. Why? Because the one we're following is love. As professed Christians, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, to be his disciples, to follow so closely right behind him that we're kicking his heels, trying our best to just be like Jesus. That in the moments that when we get carried away and we are distracted and we lose focus and we're no longer following the king and we start following after our own desires, we are no longer being loved, but then everything we do expresses hate. And God calls us to love. Let me give you a reason why we don't hate. In Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, it says that his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. There are some prophetic messages here. 
But it goes on to say that describing this battle that took place in heaven, that war broke out in heaven, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. And so that dragon who was cast out of heaven. It doesn't say that he loves a woman. It doesn't say that he loves a church. It doesn't say he loves the remnant of her seed. People, you and I, it says that the devil does not love you, but he what? Hates you and will do absolutely everything in his power to destroy you. Doesn't sound to be a very loving, no, but rather filled with so much hate and we see this as it is prophetically was spoken of how the devil through the Roman Empire tried to kill babies then to destroy Jesus and all throughout history. Exudes hate. To kill, to steal, steal, and to destroy. Prophetically spoken in the book of Daniel chapter 7 and how he's going to do these things to speak pompous words against the Most High. Filled with hate, he's going to persecute the saints of the Most High. He will intend to change times and laws. Revelation chapter 14 verse 12, part of our prophetic message of who we are as a people that despite all the hate in the world and all the persecution and trials that you will face, Revelation 14, 12 says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. A very good reason not to hate. Why we don't want to do that here is because hate is not of God. And when we hate, we manifest hateful behaviors that's not reflective of God, but of the dragon. We are acting like the beast, and I'm, not, and I'm sure there is no joy when in our hearts when we begin to exude and express hate in its many different forms today. Amen. Academy Church family, we've been called to follow the Lamb. And to follow the Lamb is to love. And when we get to a point in time in our family, in our interactions where we gossip more than we speak the gospel truth, when we tear down instead of building up, when we express hate more than we express love to one another, The church of the living God begins to look more like the dragon than the church. We begin to act like beasts, chomping and eating everything in our path, leaving a, a destroyed, destructive path behind us when we act like the dragon. But we've been called and challenged to walk and to follow the Lamb. Love over hate. It doesn't take you much or long to look around the world around us to see that there is so much hate. There's so much destruction, there's so much pain There's so much hurt. There's so much. At some point, I hope you and I will be tired of all the hate and begin to pursue and to love like Christ. That in those moments when our carnal heart wants to show its ugliness, that we would catch ourselves and say, oh, 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 Lord Jesus, please. Please. 
Because James will tell us how destructive a tongue and how powerful a tongue can be. Romans, Paul would write, and James will also affirm, how do these, these lips, how can we speak curses and blessings out of the same mouth? How can we speak so much hate and yet talk about so much love out of the same mouth? Can't do this, but mm -mm, it doesn't work that way. Three things. Gossip, gospel over gossip. We own it over blaming. And we're committed to love, to love beyond hate. Jesse, would you text that picture out? You might receive this picture if you're part of the academy churches been sent what you will find there in your picture is this little lady that was lost in our community she looked to be about in her mid 70s short stature her hair was all white as this little fragile woman who no one could really communicate with who had lost her way right here on Academy Drive. How dare you, Lord, send somebody here to our porch? Lost and confused with no one else to help. With a little bit of love, we got her into the car. Drove her down to the community resource center where they provided a bed for her to sleep, a place to shower. They gave her three meals a day. And I praise the Lord that it, the report didn't come back like this. But the picture that some of you will receive, that just this week, this lost and confused woman was finally reunited with her family. What a praise report. They have a picture of her being held. Love. She's no longer missing. She's been found. It took a collective effort of people to express love in small ways. That helped this elderly, lost and confused woman to be reunited with her family. Auburn Adventist Academy Church I think we have some kids that we've lost along the way. I believe that there are some elderly folks that we've lost along the way. I believe that we have brothers and sisters that we've lost along the way. There's aunties and uncles that no longer are a part of this family. There are nieces and nephews that have walked away from this movement. There are kids, there are families that have been separated, that don't get along, can't sit together. There are families that have been broken in this community. And at some point, with a collective effort of everyone expressing a little bit of love, I think those who are lost can be found. Things that are broken can be restored. And we can continue
to love, serve, and connect. Living out our mission to reveal God's loving character in the here and now. That Jesus' prayer would be true of us. That his will be done on earth as it is in heaven starts now with a little bit of love. What's love got to do with it? Absolutely everything.